So moving on, you've heard the word collaboration. It's the big new C word in the Forest Service. Everybody's doing it. It's not new. It's not new. Emily Jane is going to tell you right now it's not new. <laughs> There's nothing that's new. It's all recycled, isn't it? Um, she's been studying how collaboratives work, and she's going to share her findings and some of the approaches at doing that. She is a, with the extension? Extension at Oregon State University. Help me welcome E.J. Davis. Thanks, I'm really honored to be here today with so many great friends and colleagues and to be part of this conversation. And I look forward to sharing some research that we've been doing on the Pacific Northwest in collaboration there. Um, before I get started though, I wanna take us temporarily far away from here. How many of you are from New England? Okay, not, not very many at all. So those of you who are from New England or maybe some others are aware that in some towns there, we still govern by town meeting everyone gets together and talks about local level decisions and issues and actually votes on them. So it's this kind of direct democracy. And so I was fortunate enough, right, to grow up in that environment. My parents had me go to town meeting all the time to learn about that. Um, the truth is I thought this was the, absolutely the most boring thing in the world. I despised being taken to town meeting. I thought it was the most inefficient way to make decisions. And so it, it's taken me many years and a long stint in Canada before I came back around to recognizing that this is interesting and look where I am now. So what I'll be talking about really briefly today is what is collaboration? How do we study it? What are some of the ways we've studied it before? And then I'll bring in some examples from a study that I'm doing with colleagues from the PNW where we do a little bit of a mixed methods focus on understanding current collaborative governance. Throughout that, I sprinkle some management and policy implications for you. So first of all, uh, if you collaborate, raise your hand. Collaborate with stakeholders. Okay. So it's pretty ubiquitous that we collaborate now in the agencies. Um, do you collaborate with an organized forest collaborative group? Okay. So less people raise their hands and some people look confused. What do, what do I mean by a forest collaborative? Well, I will definitely get around to talking about that. I like to say that we've moved the word collaborative from being an adjective to being a noun over time. So in the past, or you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, there was collaboration. You were doing partnerships. You had community efforts to respond to the Northwest Forest Plan. So collaborative historically was an adjective in its simplest sense, meaning produced or conducted by two or more parties working together. And your efforts to be collaborative took and probably still take a number of these forms from partnering with watershed councils to accomplish watershed restoration, to doing recreation work with a friends of group, or working with the community and other agencies to develop a wildfire protection plan. So collaboration is not, is not new to you. But when we use collaborative now, it's much more often a noun, not an adjective. It's come to mean some kind of organized group focused on an area of public and sometimes other lands that has enduring relationships between stakeholders um, not just a one-off public involvement process. It's an ongoing venue for dialogue and a kind of an organization that requires resources, strategy, and leadership. And some of the common activities that we know collaboratives undertake include building agreement on public lands management actions, uh, working on monitoring and learning, stewardship contracting, and sometimes supporting or coordinating cross-boundary management activities. And that's right there is the mission of one of the forest collaborative groups in Oregon, and it's really similar to many of them. And I just want to drive home this point again that collaboration is distinct from some of the traditional forms of public participation because it's a mode of multilateral rather than bilateral communication. And as such, that drives us to study some different things than we might study just about public participation. It's that ongoing relationships aspect of collaboration. In traditional public uh, participation venues, as you're aware, stakeholders come in and they interact with you to be heard. They don't necessarily have to interact with each other. They may see each other at a meeting, they may be well aware of each other, but they're not forced to have an enduring relationship, cooperation, or dialogue. Um, collaboration is distinct because all the stakeholders work within the collaborative to combine their values, their goals, and their knowledge, and then make some kind of collective statement that represents all of that to managers. So as such, as such you know, we do study some of the things we might study with public participation, some of the things that have already been mentioned, but we also do focus a good deal on understanding social interaction within collaborative settings. Um, and between stakeholders, not just between stakeholders and the agency. And we also look at collaboratives as organizations and try to understand organizational dynamics. So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about research on collaboration in general, just to orient you to this specific topic. 
it is a cross-cutting object of study. There are not really many or any schools of collaboration. It's not a social science discipline unto itself. So there's no one home for it or one stop shop you can find. However, there is quite a lot of material about collaboration in public policy and public administration theory. And that's where you can find a lot of really good foundational material. Uh, these are just some of the different terms, terminology that we use to describe collaboration or collaboratives across all these different fields. And they're really endless. So a lot of them depend on the tradition or discipline that you're coming from, what you're trying to understand, and then the analytical and theoretical tools you're trying to, you're trying to apply. Um, so for example, there's this one instance of collaboration and working with the community in New Mexico that I read about in grad school in a book. It was focused on describing that process and how it worked for the Forest Service and community and identifying insights and lessons learned. I also read another book that covered the same area in the same community, and it talked about it very differently. It was a critical cultural political perspective on how the existence of the Forest Service as an institution alienated local people and their bodies from subsistence practices that have been traditional in the area. So, you know, same place, similar objects of study, uh, very different theoretical backgrounds and trying to explain very different facets of the Forest Service community relationship. So, as you might imagine, research on collaboration is a messy world and it is uh, far, far bigger than our current focus on just forest collaboratives. And this is precisely because collaboration has bubbled up everywhere, a lot at the local scale, in response to failures of larger systems. So you have millions of local examples everywhere. The research is messy and reflects that. So if you Google Scholar collaboration, I don't recommend it, you get over three million and a half hits. You can try to get more precise and look at natural resource collaboration, you'll still get nearly two million hits. Forest Service collaboration, 45,000, which looks paltry by comparison, but do you want to read 45,000 articles? No. So this is probably actually a bit of a statement on the filtering algorithms of Google Scholar, but I still think my point stands that there is so much out there that it can be very hard to make sense of it. And then an additional dynamic to be aware of is that there's tons of material out there about collaboration that isn't research. It isn't the reporting out of research on collaboration. It may be based on research, but several generations away from it. It may be largely based on experience. So there's a lot out there about how-to tips, stories, and resources, because collaboration isn't just in natural resources management. It's huge in all other fields, medical, nonprofit, business. So if you came to me, as this, this happens often, and said, Emily Jane, I, I really would like to know a little more about how to collaborate, I would not necessarily send you to academic literature. I would probably send you to a website, maybe National Forest Foundation or one of the countless really good websites out there. Even better, I would probably tell you to talk to your peers who collaborate and who might have different experiences and stories to share. That's not to say that research has nothing to offer. That's to say that some of these how-to questions are not necessarily immediately answered through research. And you've heard a little bit about what research is throughout the course of the morning, and it's probably pretty obvious to you now that um, there's a couple of ways we produce research in the social sciences. We have expert opinions and white papers, kind of drawing on existing knowledge, existing literature, and expert opinion in the field. Um, a lot of social science is observational studies, where it precludes an experimental approach, and we're doing things like case studies, surveys, and focus groups to have a systematic way to collect information. But we are not necessarily doing a replicable experiment. And then, so experimental studies, you know, where the question can be answered with a replicable trial that can exclude those extraneous variables. As you might expect, collaboration really falls into the first two, not into the third. Um, you know, it's pretty difficult to control variables and create replicable experiments when you're trying to study human and social phenomenon that you can't really control. I also just wanted to let you know about the predilections of social scientists studying collaboration. Um, there, we have some tendencies, and I am guilty of possessing these as well. First, we tend to conduct case studies. Case study is a really in-depth analysis of a particular example of something. You lift up the hood, you look under it, you get a really detailed picture of this example and how it plays out. Rich context, a lot of detail. Um, it really can be helpful to do case studies to understand something. It can really be helpful to do comparative case studies or look at case studies that are similar and different together and identify different factors. But as a result, we have a lot of handfuls of very well-documented examples of collaboration. We have overstudied places, perhaps like Central Oregon. Um, and at times, we actually lack perspective in which to situate those case studies. We don't know the whole bounds of the phenomenon. How many collaboratives are there? What is a collaborative? What are they actually doing? And so um, I think we sometimes need to ask ourselves these questions that might seem basic and not as exciting, but are, are really important. 
Another thing we really like to do is examine process. We like to ask detailed questions about how equitable or fair it was, how did it work. Sometimes we talk about what it resulted in. Um, we're not always necessarily evaluating that, though. Oftentimes we do sort of an after-action review on what occurred and how it worked. And then this brings me to the third tendency and what you were really hoping I would talk about, which is evaluating collaborative success and outcomes. And I'm here to tell you that that is not easy and that is not necessarily done well, frequently, or systematically in research. Um, you know, that's because it's going to depend. I'll give you the, the ultimate social scientist answers. It depends. You know, uh, it depends on the goals of that collaborative effort, who's there at the table, why it exists. That's all going to lead to a variety of different kinds of outcomes. So is success going to be the completion of some project or process that people set out to do? Is it the achievement of some agreement that everyone can accept? Um, is it the achievement of the eventual downstream outcomes we want to have? And so all that variability makes it really difficult to identify this systematically. And then finally, what helps one process succeed may not be a key factor or even a relevant issue in another instance. So I just disappointed you. I said I was not going to bring you a magical list of keys to successful collaboration. That is not what this is. Don't be fooled. This is to show you, though, some of the conclusions that researchers have drawn from different studies of Forest Service collaboration. They have not been uniformly tested in the same rigorous way across all places with the same study design, nor will these be factors of success all the time. However, these have come up a fair number of times in different case studies. And I would just note that they include different facets. They include what I would think of as sort of the organizational aspects of how collaboratives are structured and function, and they include human aspects like relationships and trust. So for the rest of my time, I'll quickly go through some examples of research on forced collaboratives that I'm undertaking with some great colleagues from OSU and the PNW, Lee, who's here. Um, this research focuses specifically on forest collaborative groups in the Northwest, collaboratives as a noun, as I mentioned before. And we're interested in characterizing how they're organized, how they operate, and if we can link any of those organizational features to perceptions of success. Uh, first, we did a rapid assessment just to get a handle on what the organizational features of collaboratives were. There is one list of collaboratives available in Oregon. There isn't a list really available in the other two states we were looking at, Washington and Idaho. And the list in Oregon was, um, had gotten outdated by this point. So we had to develop a selection logic for what collaboratives were. We had to collect basic information about their age, mission, and other features. And this is a key informant exercise. So we weren't going out and surveying everyone in collaboratives to get their opinion. We were speaking to one key individual from each group that was in an expert position to provide this information that is ostensibly somewhat factual. Then we did a survey to collect data about perceptions of collaboration, um, perceptions of why, of, of how they're succeeding or not succeeding, motivations to participate, and actually really interestingly, some demographic information about who's collaborating that I don't think has been collected lately in this area. And this was targeted to reach the population of people who participate in the collaboratives across Oregon. We haven't done it in Washington and Idaho yet. And then we did match this with case studies. We've done four in Oregon. We're going to do two more each in the other two states. As I said, these allow us to have in-depth understanding of how specific collaboratives work that will augment the other information that we have. Uh, we chose four case studies that, with similarity in terms of their organizational features and all more than six years old so that we had um, experience and, and longer time period to study there. So now I'm just going to share a few very quick, very simple examples of what our study has revealed. And we're not done. So they're going to be focused really on the assessment and the survey. You might think that this is not revelatory, but I, I kind of think it is. We have 41 of these collaboratives across three states. We have at least 25 in Oregon. The reality is we have a lot of collaboratives. I don't think many people can name the number of collaboratives easily. Um, and, and a really important aspect of this finding is 40% of them have emerged in the past five years. And to link that up to other findings in the past on collaboration, trust and time spent working together are, are really key. So one possible management or policy implication might be that this particular model of working together is relatively new, and we might need to temper our expectations about how we work with them and what we think we're going to achieve. We also tried to characterize in some standardized way the organizational features of the collaborative. So we compiled information on different features, such as frequency of meetings, use of committees, dedicated facilitation, presence of operational charters and rules. And we assigned those numbers and then compiled them to make scores. We're calling it a formality score. A higher formality score, like an 8 to a 10, indicates they're more formal, and a lower score indicates they're less formal. We are not necessarily saying if that is better or worse. That's just what it is. Um, it's worth noting that a higher formality is really common, particularly in Oregon, and you'll see that eight there. 
um, green in the organ column is really high. So that particular model of collaboration is very popular. That means they have all those organizational features. The only one they don't have is they're not a 501c3 organization, which is not common in collaboratives anyway. Only six of the collaboratives in the Northwest have that. Another thing we looked at was satisfaction, and this is a classic social science thing to do. Um, this is not a flawless method because we're asking people to self-report on their satisfaction. It's not an arm's length way of measuring outcomes, but it's still a common practice and something that's interesting to see. Um, I hear a lot of people complaining sometimes about collaboration, so I was curious to know, are, are they satisfied or not? And this is just from the survey results in Justin, Oregon. And we found that overall satisfaction was very high. So 65% of folks there are satisfied or very satisfied. And when we asked them to rank satisfaction with a number of different facets, specifically breaking that down, satisfaction was high for most of them on the list and low for very few of them, in a sense about the things that would continue collaboration. They want more funding, they want more outreach. Uh, then what we did is we tried to relate those organizational features to the survey results. Um, we broke out and analyzed perceptions of success by the groups that respondents were from, by the formality scores of those groups. So again, as you saw, yes, satisfaction is high, is fairly high everywhere, and that's really an important take home. We are satisfied with collaboration. But digging deeper, we actually found that participants in the collaborative groups with that common score of eight are statistically more likely to report being dissatisfied or very dissatisfied, and they're less likely to report being very satisfied than others. And so more than a quarter of respondents in that formality group eight were dissatisfied overall. So then we have to ask, you know, is this common model deficient somehow? Or is there something else these groups might have in common that's leading to this greater likelihood of dissatisfaction? And this is something I'd like, I'd like to keep asking more questions about. Finally, another way that we got at success was doing an importance performance comparison ranking. So we listed a number of possible outcomes of collaboration. We asked respondents to then rank how well they thought their collaborative was doing on those, as well as how important those were to them. Um, this allowed us to see where importance and performance were aligned and out of line. And so I display the top two here from each, from each sort of intersection. So high importance and high performance were implementation and the level of trust that was available in the collaborative. So these are the things that folks think are going well. High importance but low performance is ecological outcomes and implementation again. So interestingly, there's two camps of opinion about how well implementation is going, but there's still agreement that it's important. And then for low importance but high performance, where things are going well, but maybe it's, it's not as necessary or not as uh, worried about, is use of innovative tools and approaches in the agencies, and then public support and awareness of the collaborative. And finally, there were not actually any items that were low importance and low performance. You know, this is very simple, but I think looking at where those importance and performance outcomes align and don't align can help us understand better where we might want to focus our efforts collectively to improve collaboration and where we also want to make sure we keep up the, the good work and don't let that down. And I'm just going to wrap up by talking about a few words of wisdom about using science that probably apply to using any kind of science, not just social science and not just science about collaboration. but. I think what's really important to note is that scientists are not always going to be right or have the right answers that you want at the right time. I think the key for all of us is to keep asking, in instead focusing on asking the good questions, the thoughtful and challenging questions about collaboration, and then keeping alive a pretty open, honest, critical, but informed conversation about it so we can keep improving it and where necessary, actually move it on to new forms where it's not working. And then, you know, this second quote, Tom Spies says he didn't say this, but I think he did, and it was really brilliant, so I keep quoting him. He probably doesn't like it. He's not here. I think, um, I really love this. Science is not a crystal ball. It's a campfire. You will not look into it and have the future illuminated for you or get all the answers or a recipe for success. But, you know, as a campfire, it generates heat and light and warmth, and it makes people want to come to it. So it can be a place to draw together for conversation, have some things to think about that you might not think about normally. And so with those two considerations in mind, I really look forward to us continuing to take time around the campfire, even as we're working really hard to achieve the great, great expectations of collaboration. Thank you.